Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Ruben E. Goff. Good to be with you here on this Sunday morning as always. Thank you for tuning in. And I want to say a big thank you to all of you as viewers and a big thank you to those of you that prayerfully support us here at Experience Life Today. Without your prayers, this is not even possible to begin with, to be effectual and, and to be effective to the world at large. And I want to thank those of you that faithfully support uh, Experience Life Today. Without you, you. Uh, we're unable to be on the air and to be on in a monthly basis and year to year. So a huge thank you. Also thank all of you who share prayer requests. You say, why I say thank you about that is because you evidently trust us enough to share those requests and we get to share in helping in the burden of prayer with you. And I'm very thankful to hear the testimonies and what God is doing in people's lives. And so don't forget to write us after the prayer request when you get these answers and things. We want to be able to share also in the joy of knowing how God has answered for you. And, and so we just want to praise and worship God as a result of it. Now today on the program, we are going to get into a message called Taking a Risk. You say, what in the world is that? We're talking about a chance? No. In the sense of, yes, but, but not in the way of a Las Vegas style. This is an assured risk. And we're going to take you over to the book of Luke and also a little bit in Matthew about the woman with the issue of blood. And she really did take a risk. She had tried everything else in her life. She had tried doctors. She had tried all of the medical uh, side. She exhausted every avenue of solution physically to change her 12-year condition that she had been suffering uh, through and for many of those years. And so finally, when she hears of Jesus Christ, she hears of this solution, God's solution to man's problem of sin and all that sin entails and all of the sickness and all of the physical breakdowns that unfortunately we experience in life, God has provided a solution in the form of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And as he's walking the streets and as he's walking the Judean hillside and as he's coming through, uh, there is a woman who hears of this solution that she had never tried. She had never taken a risk on this. She had really exhausted all of the other risks and chances of taking in the medical side and all of the potions and all of the suggestions of people in her society and in the medical side. And finally, when she had spent all and did all that she had expended, all of that she had in her finances and materials, she hears of Christ and hears that this lowly one of Galilee is actually providing salvation and providing uh, healing for people's bodies from all the way from deaf ears being opened and hearing and tongues who were muted now loosed and now they are speaking and blinded eyes that previously lived and existed in darkness now is coming into a lighted presence and being able to see. And she's hearing that there are cripples who are now uh, raising up off of beds and mats and pull the Bethesda and all around. And she's hearing even reports of that there are those who are being raised from the dead in the grave and now coming up out of that grave and now having life restored all as a result, not because of the medical side and not because of doctors this and that and doing some uh, potion as they would have done in that day. Nothing of the sort. Instead, she's hearing that this one person getting in his presence, that if he lays hands on you or he speaks a word over your life or if you can touch him, there is some uh, uh, un, unbeknownst to, how can I say this, uh, non-descriptive power, virtue, that literally is an aurora around his life and it comes from him and is released. And when it's released, the person is affected and the deficiency is changed from being sick to well, from being in death now to be living, from being blind to seeing, from deaf to hearing, all from being crippled to now walking. She's hearing all this. So now she hears about this. And now she decides to take a risk. And this is something we'll really talk about in this message. She decides, I'm going to take a risk. I've tried everything else. None of it has worked in all of these 12 years. 
Her blood has not staunched. She is, she is continuously dealing with this. She has depleted energy. Blood is energy. And she's losing it. And you can imagine how she feels. She is de dilapidated in body. She's deprived of her energy. She's lived like this. Now, she comes to the presence of Christ. He's walking, being thronged. Here she is. She says in her heart, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. And that hem of the garment is not just a little seam as we think here in America in our clothing. The hem of his garment was not talking about a seam. The hem of his garment was literally multiple tassels. Was lit, they called pomegranates all around the edge of his robe. Those pomegranates were white, symbolizing purity. In each of those pomegranates, in each of those little balls at the bottom of his robe, each of those had one blue thread, and that blue thread coming from the Old Testament, that blue thread symbolized the Word of God. So when we read this, he's, she's not just saying, I'm just going to touch the hem of his garment or a seam. What she actually said in her heart was, if I may but connect myself to the word, believe the word of God. I believe when I believe the word, there's going to be a release of virtue and power into my life to heal me. That's what she was thinking. She took a risk that day, and in the throng of that crowd, she stooped down and she reached forward and she grabbed the tassel of his garment and grabbed that blue thread. And at that moment in her heart, if I may but touch it, I know I will be healed. When she touched it, grabbed it in her hand, immediately virtue power went out of Christ, shot into her body immediately. She felt the blood stop and she felt energy began to re arise back into her body and she began to feel, I am different. What has happened here is something for 12 years they never could do. This one did in a moment. Let me tell you something. You're watching this today and you're going to hear this whole message in much more entirety and much more in substance. But I'm here to tell you, you watch this program, what they can't do for you, Christ can do for you in a split moment. What you have tried in detox and everything else, if you're dealing with drugs and alcohol and everything else, I'm going to tell you something, then take a risk. Step out and believe Jesus Christ. I've seen it. I've given the testimonies of it. What they can't do for you in 12 years, Christ can do for you in a split second, atom of time, in an instant, it can be all made well in your body, in your spirit, in your soul, and in your mind. I'm challenging you today, whatever you're facing, spiritually, physically, whatever the case, take a risk, leap out of faith, touch the Word of God, and watch Him change your life. I want to begin here this evening. Uh, let's, let's launch out here uh, expanding our minds and expanding our opportunities tonight. I'm going to be going to the book of Luke eventually, Lord willing. And uh, I, I want to begin here, though. And I, I'm just going to ask, oh, Brother Matt's got his, yeah, Brielle, hey, come on up here, Brother Matt. Sit down here by, by Brenda Lou, if, if you... <laughs> <laughs> if you could, oh, uh, just over here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use him in just a moment. I'm going to refresh your minds here in a second. But I want you to look at this scripture on the wall, Proverbs 29 and verse 18. You can follow on your Bibles, but it's up here for your convenience because I'm going to move through some things. But in Proverbs 29, 18, very powerful verse, one that you are very well acquainted with and aware of. Let's all read it <coughs> together. <clears throat> if we can. Are you ready? Is everybody ready? Everybody excited? All right. Fingers tingling, right? Here we go. Ready? Where there is no vision, what happens? But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I'll start from the back end of that. It is true. You want happiness? Obey the word of God. 
Obedience to the word produces happiness in the heart and soul and in ourselves, in our relationships, and in a church and wherever. I'm not there tonight, but I just want you to see where there is no vision, the people perish. It is the necessity of vision. And I'm going to be showing you and teaching a little bit and expanding our minds, taking a risk in life. And life requires that at times to take a few risks. It's, it's literally the word risk is an offshoot of the word faith and meaning that sometimes in the natural it looks like you're taking a risk, but in the spiritual side you're just taking a walk of faith. Amen? Uh, you see where we're going. But vision is very important and everybody has to have a vision has to have vision, something of a photograph in the future. I'll lightly touch on this. Uh, and, but where there is no vision, the people perish. Uh, Brother Matt, if you would just stand about three feet off of that wall facing me and just one more time to show you the power of vision. What does vision do for us? It's a photograph of your future. God implants it into your heart. It's something inside. You can't always tangibly even put it into words, but you know it. Now, how many knows what I'm saying? There's a knowing that I know and something God has given for you to do in your life. Let me just break a news bulletin. Your life's mission isn't just getting up, eating breakfast, going to work, coming home, uh, uh, eating supper, putting, folding your, uh, your feet over on a lazy boy recliner and watching TV for the rest of the night. Did you know? that God has a plan that exceeds that. All right, just to cut through the air, that there's more to our lives than going through the, the regimens and routines of, of life. God has a mission for us, and it is in that photograph that is called vision. Now, what does vision do? We've learned this recently. As long as I have a vision, I can see Brother Matt into the future. I see him. There's a distance between me and him. There is a highway to be traveled to him, and that is the vision. What does that vision do? That vision, vision of good, vision of excellency, vision of a better tomorrow, better day. Uh, it, is a, it is something in the future that is better than where I am now. It is better than every difficulty that I'll face. It provides something in me that the world cannot produce. You know what it is? It's not happiness. It is a true sound joy in knowing that God is going to be there at the end of the day. Amen? And so when I see Brother Matt, he is typifying that vision. God has given me a vision. He's given you a vision. And what is it? It is for the purpose of stimulating me and you in our prayer present difficulties. As long as I can see him, Paul said, I press towards the mark. He saw that end of vision as a goal. I'm running a race and I know there is something better waiting on me on the other side. As long as I can see Matt standing over there, no matter what I face, if I come up against these steps and it's a hardship, it is a trial, it is a tribulation, I come up against these steps and they are designed, uh, one end of it, Satan wants to use it to destroy me and destroy you. He has designed this to be a stumbling block to cause failure and faultiness into my life and bring a, a repute against the image of Jesus Christ. However, Jesus Christ can take the same scenario and use it for his glory by literally keeping the vision alive in your life, stimulating you to press towards, uh, press towards the mark, put your shoulder up against the grind and keep going. As long as I have my eyes on the prize, I'm stimulating it doesn't matter what happens here, how, how hurtful this becomes, how painful this is as an experience, as long as I see him. What is he typifying? That's a better future, a better tomorrow. That is a pain-free place. It is a better place for me to exist. And as long as I have that in my mind's eye, it doesn't matter what I'm going through now, I know there's a better tomorrow. And how many knows what that does? It produces something called hope in the life. Amen? Now, Brother Matt, if you'd sit back down just for a moment, but you take that vision away, what happens? People perish. Why? Because there's no hope of a better tomorrow in future. You take him away or I get distracted. I face this same hardship. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to perish. I'm going to have failure in my life. Why? Because there's no stimulation. There's nothing provoking me to move forward. Now what happens is when I'm facing this, I keep looking towards that prize. I keep looking towards that vision. It's stimulating me in the present. You take that away, I no longer I'm looking ahead. I'm no longer hopeful of a better tomorrow. Now I'm becoming debilitated by the pain in my present and now all I'm doing is I'm starting to look around at my problem and now I become hopeless and thinking this is the way it is. Life will never change. There's not a better tomorrow. This is just my life and I'm just going to live and then I'm going to die. That should not be a part of
part of the Christian's life. We should be like this. I'm living today. I'm facing some hardship today, but there's a better tomorrow. And when I get into tomorrow, there's going to be a better next day. And someday when the trumpet sounds, there's a place called heaven. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, when they were going through all the hardships, Brother Matt, of, of, of physical persecution, you know what they said? Paul said to them, I know you're in a hard place. I know you're under threat. I know it's painful. I know you're losing family members, but I've got a good vision for you. There's coming a day when you're going to hear the voice of the archangel. You're going to hear the voice of the Son of God saying, come up hither, and there's going to be a trumpet sound, and the dead in Christ is going to rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord. Listen to this. And forever we'll be there with him. And then he said in verse 18, he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. What was it? There's a vision. There's a hope of a better tomorrow and future in your life. Without vision, we perish. This is why today it's under assault in the church. You don't preach on the rapture. And what it is, it's a demonic doctrine because when you take away the rapture, you take away vision. You take away a hope of a better tomorrow. Honey, the earth right now is not going to improve in this sense, in a worldwide sense. <laughs> We're going to do everything we can. We're going to die trying. But eventually there's a tribulation coming and we need to get out of here. <laughs> Can you shout amen tonight? And thank you, Brother Matt. I'll, I'll let you get back to your family there. But, but I just want you to see the importance of vision. When that hope is gone, we become hopeless. I'm building on something here in Proverbs 23, 7. I want you to read this with me as well because we're dealing with a mind here and expanding this thing. 23, 7. Ready? Let's all read it together. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. <laughs> Amen. Let's reread that again. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There's underlying principles here in this verse and other things that I'm not getting into it. I want to just extract that off of the surface. It is true as a person thinks, that is how they are. If a person thinks a certain negative way, that's the way they're going to be. You're going to see it in their demeanor. You're going to see it in the way they walk and live. Now, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just carry this on. If you think like a pauper, you'll live like a pauper. Are you hearing me? If I think like a beggar, I'll live like a beggar. How I think here is what will be demonstrated in my life. Amen? Now, I'll just give you a little bit more. In Ephesians 1.3, Let's read this together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath what? Blessed us with, with how much? Oh, isn't this beautiful? Jesus died on the cross, save your soul. He opened up the treasure chest of heaven and didn't hold back anything. He said, I'll give it all to you. Look at that. Who have blessed us with all what? Spiritual blessings in where? heavenly places where at in Christ wow <laughs> that's powerful one more thing Romans chapter 12 verse 2 let's read this one and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of what your what your mind that you may prove test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God as a man thinks so is he you know, God, in verse 2 of that last verse that I showed you up here in Ephesians, God can literally promise you all of the blessings of heaven. He can promise me all of the blessings of heaven. He can say to me, I'll use myself, Reuben, here is all of the blessings of heaven. They're all yours to richly enjoy. This, this is all yours. You can have, if you can see it, you can have it. If my Bible says it's there, take it to the bank. It is in the, it's in the vault of heaven and you have been given given access through the cross that Jesus would be speaking and saying that I died, shed my blood, I've entered, you can enter into me, you've entered into the blessings of the Lord, you can have it. Now listen to this. However, if I've been trained to think like a beggar, I will be saved having access to the kingdom. But listen to this, but I will live like a beggar. Now listen, there's a lot of people saved tonight who are not accessing all of the things of heaven because they've been trained to think like a beggar. Well, if we think like a beggar, we'll act like a beggar. 
This is stretch us a little bit. If, if I can be saved, I, I'm saved, but I'm thinking like a beggar, so I'll act like and I'll live like a beggar. If, if I've been trained, I'll take it a little bit further. You ready for this? Uh, cinch up your belt, put on your steel toes, here it comes. If I've been trained to deal with problems, and many people are trained by example. <laughs> if I've been trained, this is why it's so important, mature or older Christians should always be understanding younger Christians watch them how they act. Children mimic adults. All right? Now listen to this. If, you've been, if I've been trained to deal with problems when I encounter a problem, and if I, I've been trained to deal with problems by self-pity, complaining, and all kinds of negative attitudes, then I have access at the same time. I have access to love, joy, peace, and power, yet I'll experience none of that because I'm thinking like a beggar. I'm acting like a beggar. I'm acting because why? I've been trained my mind. When I encounter something, I just fall into a puddle of self-pity. I fall into all kinds of negative attitudes. I fall into the trap of complaining. Instead of accessing the things of heaven, and, and literally becoming enriched in love and joy, peace and power. I need to experience the treasure of heaven and stop thinking like a beggar and act like I really have the wealth of God existing in my soul. Amen? And so, because why? Why is this so important? Because how a man thinks, that is how he is. How a man thinks also determines where he's going and how much he will do for Christ. Think about this. God has a way of stretching your faith. One thing I found about God, he doesn't like anybody getting stuck in a rut. Is it getting quieter in here? <laughs> just about the time, are you hearing me? Just about the time you start getting comfortable and thinking, boy, this is the way it is. I found a good routine. This is it. About that time God comes and he says, well, it's time to move forward now. And you say, well, wait a minute. I like where I am. No, it's time to move. Why? It's, it's human nature to like to get in a rut and stay in that rut. But however, when you're in a rut, you're not going in anywhere. Uh, it, it, being in a rut is spinning your wheel like rocking on a chair. A lot of energy expended, but not doing anything. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> because my mind, my thinking is so trained, it won't let me get to that place of joy. Let me say this one more time as I'd added in my notes. I want you to, to hear this. If I've been trained to deal with my problems by self-pity, by complaining and all kinds of negative attitudes... And even though uh, I can have access to love, joy, peace, and power, and ex I'll experience none of it. Why? Because my mind and my thinking is so trained, it won't let me go to that place in God. Nothing ever is going to get better. That's how we start thinking. It's just the way it is. That's what, I, that's what I've done. And, and, and when I do that, listen to this, when I say this, nothing's ever going to get better. If I say those things, it's just the way it is. Nothing's going to change. Then what I've done is this. I have this written down is that I put my mind, by my mind, on everything that has happened to me being based on no expectation on a godly future. I've based every, my expectation on something ungodly, no expectation of a godly future. My mind has got to expand beyond that. And, and I dealt with this, and we get into the message tonight in Luke chapter 8, but, but I dealt with this on a Wednesday night. We, we also have to understand uh, the difference between opportunities and options. Options and opportunities are different. You know, somebody say amen to this. Because <laughs> what is an option? I'm going to hit this and run. An option is simply a possibility to do something. It doesn't mean it's good. doesn't mean it's bad. An option means there's just a choice. Okay? An option is simply a possibility to do something, good or bad, profitable or unprofitable. An opportunity, however, when you say the word opportunity, it means that it is a favorable situation for a positive outcome or occasion to advance oneself. 
Every time a person presents us with an apparent occasion to do something that previously wasn't there, a lot of times we fall in the trap, we automatically label it as an opportunity. However, it's not always an opportunity. Uh, every option that comes is not for advancement in our lives. We have to be careful of that. And many times we can choose the wrong thing. Maturity, though, evaluates everything presented to it. And when presented, what may be an option, it not necessarily a good opportunity for progress. That's why we must know the difference between the two. So when that ma mind it is presented, Satan brings something this way, hey, here's an option, and he'll bottle up, it's an opportunity. It may not be an opportunity. It may be a choice to go down the wrong road. And so we have to understand the difference. Can you say amen? Now, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 8, because this is where we're building up. Turn to Luke 8 and look at 43. Luke chapter 8 and verse 43. <clears throat> oh, this woman is a powerful woman. She took a risk, and I mean, you talk about paying off. In the natural, it made no sense. According to the world system, it, may, it had no, no basis in any kind of textbook, nothing. This was a risk uh, that really paid big dividends. I'll show it to you in a minute. Look at verses 43 from 48. You know the story well. It says, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, Jesus, and touched the border of his garment. Immediately her issue of blood staunched her and stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter said, and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody had touched me for... I perceive that virtue or power has gone out of me or is gone out of me. When the woman saw that she was not in, she came trembling. And falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. You talk about a powerful story. That's a powerful story. That is a story about risk and faith. She had to take a risk that defied human logic. Inherently, you're not born with this. This is something that is deposited in us even after uh, salvation and regeneration, before it as a lost soul. It is not something inherent. It's not something we are born with. And this thing of believing in Christ, trusting in Him in the unseen and in the unseen person. This story here is about someone who is willing to step out, launch out, take a risk, and see what happens. This woman had a problem. You better believe it. She had a bloody flux. She had an issue of blood, a continual stream of blood for 12 years. Understand she had tried everything and nothing helped. She simply heard about Jesus and she determined to risk everything in her life determined to risk everything and being chided and made fun of and everything on him and what she had heard about him. In Matthew chapter 9 and verse 21, it gives us a little bit more insight on her thoughts and simply said that she said within herself, if I may touch the border or hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. In the actual Greek language, it does give us insight that basically Jesus said, you look, you took your faith, you literally took a risk and believing on me. And he rewarded her for that. And she took that risk, trusting Jesus. And when she did, her life changed forever. And she had nothing to lose. And, and so she, she launched out, nothing to lose. Think about this. And there's lessons to be learned in these little few verses, which is a powerful, impactful story in the story of the life of Christ and him literally demonstrating his power and literally somebody drawing upon that power. If God is in, how many believes this when we say God is in control if we yield to him? Amen. Do you all believe that, that God is still sitting on his throne tonight? We all believe that. And, and, and so here comes the question then, if God is still in his control faculty, and he is, and if God is still sitting on the throne, then why, think about this, then why do we, what do we ever have to lose in trusting him to take care of our problems? Think about this. Now, I'll throw some other questions. If Jesus is the Savior, and we all believe He's the Savior, right? 
And we believe that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And if you believe that, you can say amen. And so we believe that. And, and so then what do we have to lose in trusting him? Think about it. If, if he's on his throne and he is in control and, 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 and if he is Savior and he's King of kings and Lord of lords, then what do we have to lose in trusting him? And, and if the Holy Spirit, we read this in the Bible, that the Holy Spirit, where, where does he live? He dwells inside of you and inside of me. Every believer, the Holy Spirit dwells by his presence on the inside of them. How many also realizes that if the Holy Spirit lives in us, he is also guiding us. Do you believe that he leads us? And then what do we have to lose in just trusting in him? <laughs> Come on. This will, this will require your mind to expand and begin to rely and to become trustworthy or trusting in the one who is trustworthy. And then the problem then is why is it so hard for Christians, not unbelievers, we understand that, but why does Christians seemingly have such a hard time in trusting in this one who is the most trustworthy in the universe and, and who will apply trust to others but not put God on that same level and we can learn lessons from this dear lady and we look a little deeper and so we will in verses 43 and 44 if you just scan those two verses with me and she basically uh, she took this risk on an order on orthodox way and and we understand the word orthodox and unorthodox and and she went from uh, orthodox methods to an unorthodox method to get healed <laughs> what do you mean by that the orthodox way of the time was you went to the physician we're not slamming that. We're not making fun of that. We're not demeaning the value of, of, of medical, the medical side, but that is the orthodox way and that is the human dependency when it's sick and needs help. Obviously, it goes to the medical side. It, it is the orthodox way, but, but you know there comes a time that, 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 that medical side runs out of answers and, and runs out of options and, and you know uh, then you have to resort to an unorthodox method. She spent and everything, everything she had, the Bible said she spent everything, every dime she had, she invested in the orthodox method of this world and it left her high and dry. And, 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 and if you have health problems, what do you do? You do go to a doctor. That's right. Well, she tried that, but she was not getting better. She was basically getting worse and worse. So she, she decided to do something totally against the grain of human psyche and thinking. She says, I'm going to break out of the orthodox box and prison that I'm in. And I'm going to step outside that box and I'm, I'm going to take a risk and do something I've never done before. And how many knows if, if you want something to happen in your life that's never happened in your life before, you've got to start doing things you've never done before. <laughs> Come on now. And so this lady had already done it for 12 years repetitiously and year in and year out. And she was not getting better. Finally it dawned on her. And listen, I, I'm doing the same thing, getting the same results. So if I want things to change, I, I've got to do something different to break this cycle in my life. Boy, I hope this gets through to us tonight in understanding if you want something to change, you've got to do something different in your life to produce that change. Amen. If you're tired of getting corn then stop planting corn seed. Let's change and get some wheat seed and produce a different harvest. Amen. And you see, what did she do? She went, look at that. Where did she go? She came behind him in verse four. She went to Jesus. <laughs> I tell you, there's no better person to go to. I said, there's no better person to go to. I don't care if it's spiritually. I don't care if you're having a mental uh, what a problem of the day. You have a physical problem, an emotional problem. I don't care if it's physical, disease, sickness, whatever, spiritual battle. I tell you, the one to go to is Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, she turned away from the direction most would have taken. Everybody else. How many knows that, that the crowd is not always right? Popular opinion is not always right. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> how do you know? Well, look at the 12 spies. The majority said we can't take the land. We can't do it. We understand the promise of God, but we just can't take it. Only two, the minority was right. It's still the same way today. Honey, the majority, even in America, popular opinion does not mean it's right. Right sometimes is a minority. And she turned away from the direction most would have taken. Everybody else would have taken what she previously had done and had hopelessness. Most would have gone to another uh, a doctor, another way, and another, and just would have just given up. But she didn't do either. She decided to take a risk 
that was very unorthodox and she went to this one we have fallen in love with in this church and many of those watching is we fell in love with Jesus. Now understand he was not an MD. He did not have, he was not Jesus Christ MD at the local doctor's office. He, he did not have an office at the local hospital. He, he wasn't an MD. He had not graduated from medical college in the upper echelons of universities of that day. No, he didn't have an office. He didn't have nurses. He, he didn't have assistants. As a matter of fact, he didn't even have a scalpel. However, the Bible proclaims that he is not just a physician. The Bible says he is the great physician. <laughs> oh, glory to God. It's the same premise that he's not just a king. He is the what? King of kings. He, he's just not a lord, but an owner. He is the Lord of all lords. And he's not just a physician. He is the great physician. Jeremiah said he is the balm of Gilead. <laughs> I, I tell you, that verse there will preach for a year. I, I love that. But she's, she took a risk on the unorthodox and Jesus changed her life. My, I tell you what, folks, I'm finding more. I, I thought I really knew God uh, 20, uh, what is it now, 19 years ago. I really thought I knew God. I'm telling you all these years later, I'm just finding out I'm really just getting to know who he really is. <laughs> Come on. How many's learning this? As, I mean, just as each year goes on, you think, I really thought I knew this. <laughs> and you're just gaining more and more insight. The world today has its own standards for success. Did you all know that? They have their standards, but it may not be God's standards. You see, we're, we're supposed to follow the rules society lays out for all of us, and we're supposed to be orthodox, and don't upset anything, and don't cause any waves, and, 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 and by all means, don't speak the name of Jesus, and don't carry your Bible, and, and, and be, it, it'll set the stage for repercussions. And, 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 and they also say that if you want happiness, this is the world, if you want happiness, what's their answer? Get more stuff. If you want to be happy, get more things. If you want fulfillment, you got to get more money. That's the world. If you want contentment, you've got to get more stuff and more money. <laughs> Are you, are you listening, brother how, Tim? I mean, how about that's that's the world says that you got to get all of this. But but if you have a problem, if you have a problem, you just got to work your way through it. That's, this this is the world. But I want to tell you something. When you go against the grain and you follow the Lamb of God, you know to the world you become a rebel. Actually, they're rebels, but we become a rebel to the world. Amen. You see, we got to do what the woman did. If you want happiness, and I say that to those who are watching, if you want happiness, you don't need another thing or a pay raise. You don't need, you'll not find contentment in stuff and money or people. Do you know what? If you want to be happy, then turn to Jesus. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. If you want fulfillment, listen to this, you want to have fulfillment on the inside, you know what you do? Get saved. <laughs> I'm telling you, get when, I tell you when you get saved, when you receive the gift of salvation, guess what happens? You get satisfied on the inside. Woo. If you want contentment, listen to this one. Got these written down. If you want contentment, be satisfied with where the Lord has you in your life and be open to where he's wanting to take you in life. Whew. Glory to God. I'm about ready. I'm glad Brother Donnie's sitting closer to where that door, he's getting closer all the time. <laughs> you see, I'm telling you, Christians, listen to this. You know the Christian world, I, I say this unfortunately. I have these things written down. Uh, unfortunately, it has its own standards for success. Did you know this? I didn't say the Bible, but you know, church today, uh, across America and around the world, much of the churches, they have their own rules. How about it? They have their own ideas. And they've set up their own standard. And, and, and I have some here. If, if you want to have a successful church, you know, uh, follow the rules that they have set, all of the right programs. I said this just recently. I'm afraid the church in America is getting over-programmed, but they're under-discipled. There's a problem there. We're disciple people, not over-programmed them. Matter of fact, if you program something, and they're either a robot or a computer, and we're neither... <laughs> Some of you get that tomorrow morning. Just let that sink in. All right. If you want to have, you know, have the right programs, tow the denomination. Oh. If you want to have a, be a successful church, you've got to tow the line in the denomination. 
Get that camera on me, dear. I, I'm not in a denomination, and I love every minute of it. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. uh, how we, let me just, I better, <laughs> I, I, I might as well say it. Listen, uh, you know, here at this church, you know what, if I would even suggest, and it's a good thing, if I would suggest us to become a denomination, most of you would toss me out on my head, and you should. <clears throat> Now, I'm not against establishment and things and, and, and going, but, but, but listen, I'd rather not be full of politics in God's business. My, my, my. What about, listen to this, do everything like every other church and you'll be successful. Now, what about Jesus? What about 12 disciples? You think about this. What's orthodox about using 12 men to turn the world upside down? Huh? Now, now just stay with me on this. What, what's orthodox about going against everything the re religious establishment thought? The Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and all of them. Jesus, he was an irritation to them people. They were the denomination of the day. You, if you didn't follow their rules, you didn't get ordained. And Jesus may say, I don't care. I've been ordained by my father. Amen. Last time I checked, he's the one that should do the calling anyway. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Now, we need a church, and I pray that this church and many other churches, I pray become afraid of not going against the grain. I think we need a church that is willing to follow the will of God no matter what the establishment says. And it's time we quit doing things like we've always done it and just step out and take a risk on the way Jesus wants to do it. Are you here tonight? No, I'm telling you. Now look at verse 47. Oh, I've got some more things. I've got to just get to this. 47. And look down there. Just proves through that. She saw was not in, came trembling, falling down. Her unorthodox method put her on the spot before everybody there. She stood out like a sore thumb. You know, when you do obey God, you will stand out right? When you operate in faith, you will stand out. And she fell down at the feet of Jesus. Now, 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 you do put yourself in her shoes. What do you think how she thought and felt when all of this happened? Everything gets real quiet. The crowd stops. Christ stops. He wheels around. Everything goes quiet. Something's going on here. Somebody's touched me and a hush comes over the crowd. At that moment, think about what she's doing. She was out on a limb in front of everybody. But she forgot about everybody else. Think about this. I think sometimes we need to do this. Let's just forget about everybody else and just be concerned about Christ. She forgot about all of them and she just responded to, to Jesus himself. She, she just focused on him. Forget about the hundreds that's thronging around. And I tell you what, she stood out like a sore thumb. And it's the same way with real Christians today. You're going to be required to stand out. But forget about the crowd. Forget about their opinions. You just stay focused on Jesus. I tell you, it's, it's a hard spot, you know, to be a Christian today. But, but you know, most Christians today uh, like to blend in. We're not here to blend in. We're here to stand out. And I'll tell you something else. We're to stand up. We're not to wilt under the pressures. And you know, for the most part, church likes it that way to blend in. We're not. We don't, wanna, we don't like to bring attention to what we believe because it incurs things and people think less of us. I would rather people think less of me and have a false opinion than have God think less of me and have a right opinion. You see, we don't like people looking at us differently than they would anybody else. We just like to blend in, hope nobody asks us anything, but we're here as a mouthpiece for God. And we need to take a risk and stand out in the crowd. It's not to stand up to bring attention to us, it's to stand up and bring focus to Christ. There is a difference. You see, when we stand up, what are we scared of? I mean, what's wrong with being different? And why would we ever be ashamed of the Lord? I read this this week. Several times Paul would say to Timothy, he said, don't be ashamed of the gospel. 
Don't be ashamed of my imprisonment. Remember this, uh, Paul talking. And he said, I, I, was, I was amazed when I was reading the pastor. He said it several times. I thought, and that must be a problem. Because Paul, he said, don't be ashamed. Don't, don't cower back. Don't do that. He said, Timothy, at one point at the very beginning, he said, look, he said, God has not given you the spirit of this timidity and being a coward and fear is the word that's used. He said, but he's given you the spirit. He's given you love and power and a sound mind. You know what those three things will do? It'll make you stand out and stand up. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I think we need to take a leap of faith, and maybe you do tonight. Take a leap of uh, faith for Jesus Christ. Yes, it is an immoral society. And, but I tell you, we, that's just when we can stand up, stand out, and make something different, saying enough is enough. We got to do that. I, you know, when the pressures of life come, stand up, stand out, and say, look, I'm, I'm not going to stand for this. We're going to stand against it. In, in a lost and dying world, we need to stand up and say, our Lord Jesus came to save to the uttermost. Let's take a risk and step out and believe Christ tonight. Amen? You know, we need to stand out above the me mediocrity of most churches. We don't want to compare ourselves with others because they're not the standard. The standard is Jesus. Can I, can I say that again? The standard is Jesus. He's the one we compare ourselves to. And, and well, let's dare to be different. And, and let's be that which God has called. And let's don't fall in a rut. <laughs> because ruts do what? And all we do is go through the motions. We don't ever want to just fall into just going through the motions. Why are you going to church? Always keep the purpose alive in our hearts. Why am I going to church? Well, it's just what we do. No, what is the purpose of going to church? What is the purpose? You say, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to read my Bible. What's the purpose of doing that? Well, I'm just reading it. No, what's the purpose of it? Keep it alive. Keep it afresh. I'm reading the Word because I exist as a result of the Word. That Word is nourishment, and I need it, and I desire it, and I want it. Well, why are you going to church? Because that God commanded, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. And the importance and purpose is when I get there, I worship, and I'm encouraged and edified by other believers in the ministry of the Word. I get to worship with other believers, and when I leave, I'm stronger than when I walked in. Amen. There's purpose to these things. And, and, and let's, let's, I tell you what, let, let's carry the torch for Jesus Christ. And, and I tell you what, let's give the community and the crowd something to talk about. <laughs> Come on. I believe it's coming. You just hold on. Believe me. Another month or so. I, I, I'm telling you, local community, they're going to be talking. Let's give them something to talk about. Let's let them know. We, we, listen, we're not cowering down in a cornfield, buttoning down the hatches, and just waiting on the Lord to come. We are waiting for Him to come, but we're occupying till He comes. Whew, glory to God. <laughs> oh, my. I tell you, well, I'm getting so excited. I'm going to hyperventilate if I'm not careful. In verse 48, can you just skip on down there and look at what she does here. And, she's, and he said unto her, rather, be of good comfort. She had tried everything else. She's been to all of the doctors. She got all the prescriptions. She went by the book. She went by the orthodox way. None of that cured her, but she was her, what cured her was her faith in Christ. Jesus said, thy faith, your faith hath made the only. Your faith has done this. Not your power, your faith. Jesus had the power, she had the faith. Did you just hear what I said? We don't heal ourselves with our own power. That's God's power. But we've got to believe it to turn it on. <laughs> this is why many churches say, well, we don't have that happening in our church because they don't believe it. I get a little amazed at some things and, and people almost stand on the soapbox and almost proud of their unbelief. <laughs> well, nobody gets healed at our church and at the same time, the preacher preaches against God doing any healing. Well, if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. God doesn't walk in, bat you over the head and say, you know, you're going to get it whether you want it or not. <laughs> doesn't work that way. How many knows this? This protocol. He goes where he is invited. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no gifts in our church and they rail on it all the time. Well, it's not going to operate. It ain't going to happen. Nobody's going to talk in tongues. Nobody's going to prophesy. Nobody's going to do anything. Why? Don't believe it. God's not going to come in and so, say, well, you're going to believe it. I'm going to do it anyhow. No, it doesn't happen that way. It's, we've got to believe these things for it to take place. She took a risk on someone who claimed to be the son of God. 
She took a risk. Look at that. She took a risk on somebody who said he'd die for her sins. We know he's already done it, but to her, he was going that direction. She took a, a risk on somebody who claimed to be the God in the flesh. She risked it all, placed all her faith in Christ. And guess what? Jesus did not let her down. And he didn't let her down. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to let me down. Am I right? You, you step off the side of that cliff. I'm telling you, you take a risk. You don't know how it's going to happen, but you know Christ has promised you leap off. I've got you in the palm of my hand. That's all I need to know. That's all you need to know, right? Oh, glory to God. We need to place our faith in Christ. We, you see, see, I'm speaking out of experience. And even recently, and we were just talking this week and things was happening. We have to place our faith solely on Christ. And here's the problem. I've done it. My wife said, we've all done it. But boy, it's got to change because when the Lord spoke to me this week, I looked out, I shared with you on Wednesday night, looking out that office window out in the drive, and I just looking out, I'm telling you, if I ever heard the Spirit said to me, He said, you will have to trust me now. That's all He said. Because many times we, when we go to take a step of faith, so to speak, take a risk, you know what we do? We count our money first. And then we say, well, we can't do that. Isn't it interesting when God asks you to do something, He doesn't check your bank account. All God says is, you believe me, I will provide. That's unorthodox. Well, it's getting quiet in here. So, well, that's right, I just counted my money. No, listen, if God said it, and, and this is what the man said, and we've been saying it all week, and it's true, if it's God's will, it will be His bill. I gotta throw something. I'm just, I can't take it. <laughs> All right, throw his hanky. You see, <laughs> you see, we counter my say, well, we can't do that. I'll tell you something else. Yeah, we're a smaller church, and we say this, and it's true. Well, we count the membership roll and say, well, we can't do that. We ain't got enough members. I tell you, we can do anything through Christ. Amen. We look at our location. <laughs> And I've said this, Brother Matt, I have. I'm, I'm, I'm just being bare bones. I'm being transparent with you. But I'm learning. <laughs> I've even looked at our location and said, <laughs> we're in Cornfield County. We can't do that. God looks down and says, that's what I'm waiting on. Use something that will defy the logic of the world. We, we might even look at each other's talents and we might say, well, we're not that talented. <laughs> I'm with you. But you know, and say, well, we can't do it. But we forget God can supply the wisdom. He can supply the knowledge. I shared that with you. It's a goofy story and shared it many times. But I'm telling you, I'm the world's worst mechanic. <laughs> You want your car fixed, you never want to bring it to me. It won't ever, it'll be worse than when it arrived. <laughs> Take it to Brother Boogie. Now, he knows cars. This guy does. I'll tell you. But don't bring it to me. And, and you see, I, I mean, he, he, you don't, matter of fact, I, this is why Lacey and I are together. Uh, she's good with her hands. I'm not. I, you know, just the way it is. I'm gifted in other areas, and I know where it's at, and she knows it. <laughs> but, I, you know, it's interesting, but if you don't limit yourself, I was fixing that car that day, and never get the horse valley. And what was that again? A, was it a brake line? A, pair, a power steering hose. And said, here, and I wanted to be a man. You know, oh, yeah, man, Horse Valley, I've got to be a hillbilly. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I've got to get the camouflage on, man. I, I'm going to be a real man here today. And, and I'm going, and she had left. I don't think she was there. No. I said, boy, I'm, I'm going to have this fixed. And inside, I, I thought, yeah, I'm the fog. Don't even ask me where it's at. I don't know what's going on. And so I get down there, and I look, and, and so I take it off, and I'm trying to get, I can't get it done. I, you know, it's probably simple, like for Brother Butch to do it. He doesn't just go there and just do it, you know. And I'm there, and I'm fumbling around and fooling around. I can't get it on. And I just pray and say, Lord, I, you know, I, I need help. You know, just like that. It was just like God gave a mind and I just, wow. He said, well, yeah, that's how it goes. And, and just fixed it. I, I mean, it was unbelievable. And I was so proud. Lacey comes home and says, you ain't going to believe what I did. I did confess it really wasn't me. After she said, oh, honey, you're the man, I said, well, I wanted to be the man, but God, 
Christ is really the man because he's the one who provided it for me. But it was, you know, we can't limit ourselves. You know, we just need to trust him and follow him. Right? We need to take a risk, totally place our faith in no one else but Jesus. I'm just going to, I'll just close on this. And uh, I'm glad we all had church tonight. I really do. All of us, all of us live lives every day. This is a little bit of a word play using the word risk and you know that. But all of us live lives of risk every day. How do you know? I will guarantee you, you risk, you took a risk driving here tonight. Huh? Yes. You risk it all as you met every car coming at you, you took a risk when you went by them. Am I telling the truth? I'll tell you what, if you crossed a bridge to get here, and you probably did, if you crossed a bridge, you took a risk. What do you mean took a risk? You know, bridges can come down. <laughs> London Bridge did, you remember? Well, anyway. Now think about this. If you and me, if we are willing to trust every bridge we cross, trust every car that we pass, trust every driver driving them, then what's keeping us from trusting Jesus more than that? Do you know that everything else in life will fail us eventually someday? Am I telling the truth? It will fail us someday. Because why? I'll give you just one little example. There will come a day the doctor will look at you and to me at the Lord Terry's and say, medically, there's nothing more we can do to keep you alive. You won't be able to do any more. Every day that we live without Jesus is a day risking eternity even. Whew. That is a risk I don't want to take. Amen? And you know, it's those ones, there's somebody not saved. I'm going to tell you, don't risk eternity. You have nothing to lose but everything to gain. Be like this woman in this story. Risk it all and say, I've run out of all of the options of this planet. I'm going to trust the one who has made the claim. He's the Son of God. He is the Savior. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he didn't disappoint her. He's not going to disappoint me either. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that you have Jesus and you're on the winning side? Glory to God. I'm telling you, I... People say it's exciting. Do you know tonight, and, and this taping, those are going, but you know those tonight, there's a lot of excitement in a stadium down in Phoenix, Arizona. Over a pigskin full of air. Now, I like football. I do. Oh, I like football. That's my sport, huh? It might be deflated. <laughs> yes, as we know, deflate gate. And all of that excitement and their team, whose ever it was, will win tonight, that they will go to bed happy. But yet tomorrow morning, all of those fans, their lives, and their problems will still be there tomorrow morning. But you know, you talk about excitement. Somebody can come to Jesus and it can change those things in the morning. I tell you from the inside out. I'm, I'm telling you, this is exciting, isn't it? This is, excitement won't just last tonight and tomorrow and maybe a week or two and wear the hat. This, will ex, the, this excitement will last us not only tonight, but following weeks and months and for years to come and eternal, eternally and forever and ever. Amen. If God's speaking to your heart tonight, you're a believer, and most of you are, if not all really, to be honest with you. If God is speaking to your heart tonight, he might be prodding you a little bit, say, look, I want you to get out of that little comfort area. I'm trying to lead you into something else. I'm inviting you tonight, take the risk. If God said it, he will fulfill it. Amen. And let me give you this little saying we've been saying, I'll say it again. If it is God's will for you, he will foot the bill. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Let's stand tonight.